What I wanna do this afternoon is share a little bit of, of my story, but that's really the wrong preposition, isn't it? Because it's not my story, it's his story. It's history with a little hyphen in there. And, and I love sharing uh, my story because it's a testimony to what God's doing uh, through my life. And that's why I believe that testimony is such a powerful thing. And so I wanna share with you some of what God is doing in Washington, D.C. Is that okay? And then this evening, um, I, I am all about one thing these days. I, I think prayer is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. And, and I want the best God can do. And so tonight, uh, I'm gonna preach a little bit out of Acts chapter 10. And I think it's a message that could really, really shape your life. Now, let me just say, you know, I caught a flight early this morning. And, and so I'm still kind of catching up to myself. So if we run on some rabbit trails, forgive me for that. But, but here's what I know. It, this is not, um, it's not about me. Uh, this is about what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life during this unique season. I don't think there are too many universities that would mark off a couple of days and say, man, let's seek God. Let's be all about um, seeking his heart and, and being about his mission. I, I just think this is huge. And, and I, I have a little saying, and if you're taking notes every once in a while, I might tell you something that's worth writing down. Uh, I'd rather have one God idea than a thousand good ideas. Uh, good ideas are good, but God ideas change the course of history. And, and guess what? You, you don't get a God idea from me. You get God ideas from God. Now, I, I hope you get a few good ideas, but this is about us saying, God, would you speak to us? Would you do something in us? us uh, during these sessions. And, and I think it's so great that there are different voices and different speakers because um, you, you never know where God is going to hit us. And so I'm excited about what the Lord's going to do. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 10 and we'll get there in just a, a few minutes. But I want to unpack a little bit of my story. Uh, I I, I was 19 years old, a freshman at the University of Chicago, and I, I was a pre-law major, um, actually politics, economics, rhetoric, and law. And so I, I thought, who knows, may, maybe I'll end up in, in D.C., but in a little different capacity. Um, kind of had an inclination towards politics, and, and so it's crazy to me that here I am all of these years later uh, pastoring a church, and, and I just want you to know that I know that the news coming out of D.C. is political in nature, but there is an incredible spiritual undercurrent. We are praying for revival in our nation's capital. And, and we're seeing it. God is moving in some incredible ways. And so at 19, something happened in my life. And, and I just, I, I never go back this far, but, but some of you are 19. So I'm thinking to myself, maybe I can and should. Um, I would honestly say that, that at that point in my life, you know, I would have told you that, that I was following Jesus and, and that, you know, um, that I was saved. But, but if I'm being totally honest with you, it, was, it really was less about me following Jesus and more about Jesus following me. I, I, I don't mean this to be controversial in any way, but I, I just wonder how many people think they're following Jesus when really what they've done is invited Jesus to follow them. And then they wonder why they're bored. But you know what? You start following Jesus, and that's what happened. I just said, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And that's a dangerous question. Now, the only thing more dangerous than asking that question is not asking that question. And so it began a summer of seeking for me and long story short, last week is summer vacation. Man, I heard that inaudible yet unmistakable voice of God and, and for me, I knew I was called uh, into full-time ministry. So I ended up um, <laughs> giving up a full ride scholarship at the University of Chicago, transferring to a little Bible college and uh, did my undergrad there and then I went to seminary. Now. Oh, I don't, I don't, we, we just met each other. 
So I don't really want to offend you at all, but I look back on, on me, and so I'll just say this personally. It's amazing how much I knew when I was 22. I, I was ready to kind of go for it, and so tried to plant a church while I was in seminary. Um, but, but there's this old saying that um, you may think you're leading, but if no one's following you, you're taking a walk. <laughs> I was taking a walk. Um, here's the funny thing. For one of my classes, uh, I actually did a 25-year strategic plan for this church plant. Now, I think it was John Chancellor who said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And so uh, that church plant failed, um, never got off of the ground, and it was so embarrassing and disillusioning. But can I just say, sometimes our plans have to fail so that God's plans can prevail. And, And I look back on it now, and I'm so thankful because If we had not failed in Chicago, we we would have never been looking for that open door. And the next thing you know, my wife and I packed all of our earthly belongings into a U-Haul truck, no place to live, um, no guaranteed salary, and we moved to Washington, D.C. And it was scary, and it was awesome because we were living by faith. We said, God, we're just going to go where we think you're leading us. And so uh, we landed there and I'm going to give you the very short version, but, but I just think it's important that um, if, if content is king, then context is queen. Um, I, I want you to understand the context and, and I want you to know today that you know what I'm sharing is more descriptive than prescriptive. Um, this is just what God's doing in one corner of his kingdom. And you know what, he wants to, Oswald Chambers said, God wants to be as original with others as he was with you. That's good. Um, and so, I'm just sharing a little bit of our story. So uh, most of you are too young to remember this, and, and you're on the West Coast where it's 98 degrees in October. But January of 96, it was our first Sunday, our first service. Now, you know, it's kind of the kickoff. It's what you've been planning for, dreaming for. It's the big day. And it's the day that the blizzard of 96 comes through the East Coast and leaves 24 inches of snow from a Saturday into a Sunday. Three people showed up to our first service. Myself, my wife, and at that point, our oldest, who was a baby. Thank you. Now, the only upside is that we did experience a 533% growth spurt in one week (laughs) because 19 people showed up the next Sunday. And, uh, you know, I look back on those early days and I'm grateful for the failure because it taught me an important lesson that unless the Lord builds the house, they who labor, labor in vain. I think that failed church plant showed me what I'm capable of or not capable of, and it kind of set me free. I I think sometimes we have this fear of failure, but I I just think that the cure for the fear of failure is not success. It's failure in small enough doses so that you build up immunity to it. And and then you discover that God's there to pick you right back up. And so we we would start services with six or eight people, And so I would uh, close my eyes and worship because it was too depressing to open them. And uh, total income was $2,000 a month. And, and I just had this thought at one point, is it even worth it? Like we could just fold up shop and these 19 people could find a much better church to attend. But sometimes you gotta hang in there and, and, and believe that God has something for you and that he who began a good work is gonna carry it to completion. So uh, 
the school where we met closed down and we ended up uh, relocating to the movie theaters at, at Union Station. Uh, by the way, who's, who's been to DC? Let me see your hands. Okay, probably a class trip, right? Um, who's, who's not been to Washington, DC? Okay, that's pathetic. <laughs> you need to do your patriotic duty and make a pilgrimage to the nation's capital. Um, and when you come, uh, the big train station, it's kind of the, the, the marketplace in DC is called Union Station. We ended up meeting in the movie theaters at Union Station for about 13 years. Now here's what's kind of funny about that. Like my wife grew up in a, in a very kind of traditional, um, maybe <coughs> legalistic um, <laughs> environment where like, like she didn't go to the theater because if Jesus came back, she might not go. And so didn't go to the theater. And, and, uh, and then our church ends up meeting in a movie theater. And, and so we set up shop and we discover what a great place to reach people who are unchurched. Well, why don't we go to where people are and create an environment where, because um, here's what I believe. I don't want to offend people for sociological reasons. The only thing that should offend them is the cross. And if they're offended by the cross, then they're offended by the only means of salvation known to humankind. But I don't wanna offend them because of things that we're doing and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And so we started meeting in a movie theater and we liked it, comfortable seats. Um, I think that the movie theater screen is like postmodern stained glass. <laughs> Seriously, and, and this is kind of one of the themes that we're gonna talk about in the afternoon session that the, the medieval church used stained glass, um, you know, pictures to communicate the gospel to an illiterate generation. We use moving pictures to communicate the gospel to a post-literate generation. And so our media team, I know you have a wonderful film school and that, the, you know, you, I, I love Biola because you're, you're on that edge where you, you realize that like, it's, it's not a pastor, it's not a pastor's job to reach this culture. And in fact, you know, really I'm, I'm more in um, an ad minister and we're all the ministers. Um, there's no sacred and secular, there's no clergy and laity, we're the priesthood of God. And so, um, and so we, and then the smell of popcorn, come on. It's our incense at National Community Church. I can't even go to the movies and not have a very Pavlovian reaction when we get popcorn. I just feel like worshiping the Lord. Um, but here's what we discovered. I think the church belongs in the middle of the marketplace. Um, one of our core values is irrelevance is irreverence. Now, I'm not talking about some gimmick. What I'm talking about is the incarnation. It's, it's 1 Corinthians, it's Paul saying, I become all things to all people, so by all possible means we might reach them. It's about not waiting for people to come to us. It's about us taking this mission seriously and going to them. So long story short, uh, our vision became meeting movie theaters at metro stops around the DC area, uh, where one church was seven locations, and our 2020 vision is 20 locations. Um, now, we also opened uh, a coffee house, which I'll tell you a little bit about, um, and we're on the verge of opening uh, our first international location, a cafe in Berlin, Germany. And so, um, what I wanna do uh, this afternoon is look at what I believe is an incredibly significant passage of scripture. It's huge. Now, we naturally gravitate towards, you know, great commandment, great commission. And I'm not at all saying that those aren't, like that's where it's at. If we're gonna be great at anything, let's be great at the great commandment. If we're gonna be great at anything, let's be great at the Great Commission. But before the Great Commission, there's what I would call the original commission. And the original commission is the very first 
mission, if you will, that Jesus sends his disciples out on. Now, wouldn't you say that that locker room speech is probably pretty significant because this is the first test. This is the moment where they are on their own. That's where we pick it up, Matthew chapter 10, verse number one. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and heal every disease and sickness. Verse five. And these 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Don't go among the Gentiles or any other Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for your journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Verse 11, whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your blessing. Just one little comment right here. I, I don't think that God has called me as a pastor to build a church as much as he has called us to bless a city. And if we bless our city, then God will build his church and that's his job anyways, right? What, what did Jesus say? Did he say, you will build my church? No, he said, I will build my church, God's gonna do his job if we do our job. And so we're trying to bless uh, our nation's capital. Verse 13, if the home is deserving, let your blessing stand. If it is not, let your blessing return to you. If anyone's not welcome, uh, welcome you or listen to your words. Shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it'll be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. And verse 16, And this is where we are going to zoom in, drill down, and unpack uh, what I believe is one of the most incredible statements uh, in the Gospels. Jesus says, here it is. I mean, how did this hit their auditory cortex? When they heard this, what were they thinking? Um, And how did it shape the way that they approached the mission? Here it is, verse 16. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. But that sounds dangerous. Yeah. Did Jesus die to keep us safe? Or perhaps did he die to make us dangerous? You see, we were born on a battlefield, but we live like it's peacetime. No, there's a a battle raging all around us between good and evil. And I would like to think that when I pronounce the benediction at the end of our services, that it sends some uh, shudders down the spine of some demons within earshot. Faithfulness is not holding the fort. Faithfulness is storming the gates of hell and taking back enemy territory. Can I give us a reality check today? Uh, I think every 21st century Christian ought to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And you will quickly realize our problems are first world problems. In AD 44, King Herod ordered that James, the brother of John, be thrust through with a sword. Andrew was hung by the neck from an olive tree like a common criminal. criminal. Doubting Thomas was thrust through with pine spears, tortured with red hot plates and burned alive. Philip was tortured and crucified in AD 54. Matthew was beheaded. Bartholomew was skinned alive and hung on a cross. James the Lesser was thrown off the top of the temple. After surviving the fall, a mob beat him to death with clubs. Simon the Zealot was crucified by the governor of Syria in AD 74. Judas Thaddeus was beaten to death with sticks in Mesopotamia. Matthias, who took the place of Judas Iscariot, was stoned to death while hanging on a cross. And Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. 
John the Beloved, was the only disciple to die of natural causes, but that's because he survived his own execution. When a cauldron of boiling water could not kill him, Emperor Diocletian exiled him to the Isle of Patmos, where he lived until AD 95. When Jesus said, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves, he meant it. They took it literally. Can we at least take it figuratively? Because I'm not here saying like everybody needs to die for Christ. Not everybody's called to a tribe of headhunters. But we all need to die to self. And we all need to count the cost. And every once in a while we need a reality check. A number of years ago, um, I went on a missions trip to the Galapagos Islands. And it almost felt wrong flying in because it's such a primitive, I mean, it felt like we should have been on a raft and like kind of come up on shore, um, completely natural habitat, um, closest thing to the Garden of Eden left on earth. It, it was incredible. We, we were there, um, there are 49 islands and many of them don't have churches, but they have TVs and uh, craziest thing, our broadcast was being translated into Spanish and getting into some of those homes. And so we wanted to go in person. It was a very unique mission trip. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, you know what? Someone needs to go to the Galapagos and it can be me. Um, un- unbelievable. Uh, and, and we had a little bit of fun too. Went swimming with sea lions. I don't even know if that's safe. But I'm here, Um, went cliff jumping, Uh, Las Grietas, jumped off of some 40 foot cliffs and just an adventurous, spent 24 hours on the high seas, kind of felt like Paul on his missionary journeys. And and we're going to these different islands and just sharing the love of Jesus. And and, uh, the thing that that was remarkable to me was the the wildlife. while we were on our boat, there were these pelicans that looked like um, prehistoric pterodactyls that would like hover over the boat and then dive bomb and the water was so clear you could see them grab a fish and come up out of the water, spectacular. 200 um, year old tortugas that were just like this big uh, and the iguanas. Oh my goodness, um, not intimidated at all. Like it was a little, you know, you get up close to them and it just, it was awesome. And so went on this missions trip, flew home and two weeks later went to the zoo. Now the National Zoo um, is a wonderful zoo, but like it just wasn't the same after going to the Galapagos, because there's no chance that you're gonna get killed. At, you know, it, they're in cages. It's just not as dangerous or as exciting. And, and so we're going through the ape house. And I have one of these moments. I'm looking at this 400 pound gorilla be, behind plexiglass and this thought fires across my synapses. I wonder if if churches do to people what zoos do to animals. Thank you. All I need is one to keep me going. I mean, here's, here's my big thought. I mean, are we trying to tame people in the name of Christ? Because when you remove the risk and the danger, it just doesn't really approximate what I'm looking at in the first century with those original disciples. I know the context is different. All I'm saying is we need to live dangerously. When, when did we start thinking that God is calling us to, eat, uh, to, to uh, safe places to do easy things? And you know deep down inside you want more than that. I pastor a church of 20-somethings, and you know what I love about this generation? I'll tell you, simply put, 
I love the fact that they want something to sell out to. Don't give me half the gospel. Get in my face and challenge me to fully surrender my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I wanna tell you something. You know, it, it was D.L. Moody who originally heard these words, but I, I've always loved it. The world has yet to see what God can do through one person wholly consecrated to him. You give your life to Jesus and you say, I'll go wherever you want me to go. You know what? You'll go some dangerous places, but God will use you in incredible ways. All right, now let's dig into this next statement because this is really where I want to focus. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as doves and as innocent as snakes. Is that what it says or did I mix that up? <laughs> no, it says be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Here's where I wanna push us a little bit. What, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word shrewd? Well, you're Biblical memory should be triggered um, because in Genesis, the serpent is called the shrewdest of all creatures. Now, Jesus knew that when he chose this word to challenge his disciples. And, and in one respect, like when was the last time someone like kind of been trying to quantify or measure spirituality that shrewdness was at the top of the list? Like it's not the first thing that comes to mind when we think about being um, a good steward or following Christ and yet Jesus says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves and what that means is you better be shrewd as a snake. In other words, you better beat the enemy at his own game. I, I, I adopted Michelangelo's uh, little motto a number of years ago. He said, criticize by creating. I, I, I get frustrated when I see the church criticizing by criticizing. Why don't we make better movies? Why don't we write better books? Why don't we start more successful businesses? Why don't we criticize by creating? I just think we ought to be more known for what we're for than what we're against. We gotta beat the enemy at his own game and that means we need to be shrewd as snakes. Now let's break this down just uh, a little bit and uh, drill a little bit deeper. The, the word uh, shrewd is a fascinating one. Um, in a sense, it means kind of an, an open mind, a sensitive mind. Uh, the Greek root can refer to the diaphragm. And so in a sense, it's kind of gut instinct. It's probably more right brain than left brain. And uh, I, I think in a sense, Oh, what it means is um, we've got to understand the, the context or maybe a way of saying it is 1 Chronicles 12, 32, the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Uh, it's crazy the way that the tectonic plates of culture have shifted under our feet in the last uh, 20 years. Um, in the last five years, it's unbelievable to me, um, the technology that's available to us and, uh, and the way that we're trying to do church. I mean, even with social media, um, with, you know, with Twitter um, and, and with all the other applications of technology, we, we live in a different day. Now, I happen to believe that we ought to redeem technology and use it for God's purposes. Is the enemy using technology for his purposes? You better believe it. I think we need to follow suit. We need to redeem it and use it for God's purposes. Um, in 1893, a $10,000 congressional appropriation established RFD or rural free delivery. Up until that point, it's amazing, it's 115 years ago. Up until this point, rural Americans had to get on their horse, go into town, and uh, pick up their mail, probably at the general store. But it was RFD that provided mail service to rural residents for the first time. 
Well, two entrepreneurs by the name of Aaron Montgomery Ward and Richard Sears saw a business opportunity. They saw a new distribution channel for their products and they produced so many catalogs that they were the second most widely read books in the country behind the Bible 100 years ago. They redeemed a new medium, rural free delivery. I think what I'm trying to say is there are ways of doing church that no one's thought of yet. If the kingdom of God had departments, I would want to work in research and development. I believe that there are ways that we can reach our culture and, and I can't imagine sharing this thought with a more significant audience because that's you. Uh, it was uh, R.T. Kendall who once said that sometimes the greatest opposition to what God wants to do next is from those who are on the cutting edge of what God did last. I don't wanna be that guy. I wanna get out of the way of what God wants to do. And so let me talk practically about how that's worked itself out at National Community Church. About 10 years ago, I saw an old crack house and uh, you saw a picture of it. And, and I, I, I was walking by it one day and I felt like there was just kind of this moment that uh, the spirit of God kind of birthed in my spirit, a, a little dream. And at first you gotta figure out like, is this a crazy idea or is this really a God idea? But, but I had a thought, that crack house, which only five blocks from the Capitol building, I thought that crack house would make an awesome coffee house. Now, the problem is, is that churches build church buildings, right? I mean, that's what churches do. Um, I, I didn't even drink coffee. And no one on our, on our staff had ever worked at a coffee house. And, and yet I couldn't shake the idea. And, and here was kind of the theological backdrop. If you read the gospels, you know, you find that Jesus didn't just hang out in the synagogue, right? He hung out at wells. Wells were natural gathering places in ancient culture. Coffee houses are postmodern wells. And so we thought, what if we create a place where the church and community can cross paths? And so uh, for five years, we circled this property in prayer. Pretty cool story. I might share more of it tonight, but four people offered more money for it, two of them real estate developers, and we own it. I can't explain that other than um, God put a contract on it when we started praying for it, and it's now Ebenezer's Coffee House. And, uh, and it was, it was voted the number one coffee house in the Metro DC area. I just think if you're gonna go in the coffee house business, if you can't compete with Starbucks, stay out of the game. Like, let's do what we do with excellence, right? Um, Dorothy Sayers uh, once said, uh, I love this. I, I dare say no ill-fitted drawers or crooked table legs ever came out of the carpenter shop in Nazareth. Let's do what we do with excellence. And so uh, we open up this coffee house. We have about 600 co uh, customers a day. And then here's the cool thing. Every penny of profit goes to missions. Uh, we're a church of 70% single 20 somethings, but uh, last year we gave a million three hundred eighty-four thousand dollars to missions. 140,000 of that was just net profit from the coffee house. Now I wasn't a math major, but I think if you have about 10 of those things, you know, it's one way to give about a million dollars to missions. All I'm saying is, I don't care if you're in ministry or business or anything in between. We need to do business as mission and mission sometimes as business. I just don't see in different categories. Being shrewd as a snake means that we see the, the God ordained opportunities that are around us and we seize them. Now, I think that we need to do what we do uh, in, in new ways. Now, I, I don't really have time to, to go there, um, but when the great commandment says, love the Lord your God with uh, all of your mind, I would suggest that that includes left brain and right brain. 
Um, I would suggest it includes the medial frontal prefrontal cortex, which is the seat of humor. But that isn't very funny, is it? Um, but it's this part of the brain that allows you to see distinctions and find things funny. I, I just think that loving God with all of your mind includes this ability to see opportunities, to create things in a new way and to do things differently. And part of that is just understanding the people that we're trying to reach. Um, since I talked about the postmodern stained glass, the brain processes print on a page at about 100 bits per second, but it processes pictures at about a billion bits per second. So that means that a picture is not worth a thousand words. It means a picture is worth 10 million words. What I'm saying is we've got to find new ways, new wineskins to communicate the gospel message. But let me close with this. Can't just be shrewd as a snake. Find new ways of doing things. Uh, one of our core values, everything is an experiment. Uh, there are people here that have God ideas that will reshape culture, reshape church, reshape business and politics. Uh, that's pretty exciting to me. But at the end of the day, you can't just be shrewd as a snake. You have to be innocent as a dove. And so let me take just a couple of moments to talk about that. I'm someone that is really kind of a simpleton. I just think that the people that God uses the most are the people that spend the most time with him. Because I think that's who he can trust the most. If you said, tell me about your college experience, um, what was most memorable about it? I would actually tell you two things. One was a class in immunology at the University of Chicago Hospital Center, most impactful class I ever took. Um, I, I would literally walk out of that class thanking God for hemoglobin. I don't think my professor believed in God, but like the whole thing was like an exegesis of Psalm 139. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. That experience, I think every ology is a branch of theology, and, and Alan so eloquently said that earlier today. And the other experience really had nothing to do with a classroom. My senior year, I was desperate to hear from God, because I knew it was my last year and I needed to figure out where to go and what to do. And so almost every lunch hour was spent in our chapel. And uh, usually it was me and the janitor. And I would go up in the balcony and I would just pace back and forth and back and forth. And it's where I learned to hear the voice of God. Don't worry about meeting the right person. Meet with God. God will make sure you meet the right person. Don't seek opportunity. Seek God. And opportunity will seek you. Like, I'm not saying you don't ask someone out on a date. I'm not saying that you don't put together a resume, you know, and ship it out. All I'm saying is, to me, it always comes back to, um, am I motivated by God's glory? I think that our root problem is selfishness. I think it's, that's at the very root of sin. Before the fall of Adam and Eve, there was the fall of Lucifer. What was that about? Well, he just couldn't stand for God to have all of the attention. He wanted a little bit for himself. He wanted to be worshiped. I think our problem is, is that we want the world to revolve around us. And uh, there's a whole nother philosophy of mine, but I think that's why you get married. Because it's the best method of uprooting selfishness in your life known to humankind. And by the way, it usually never fully works and so God gives us children. <laughs> and for some of us, it takes large families for us to get past the selfishness. In the kingdom of God, if you do 
the right thing for the wrong reasons, it doesn't count. And, you know, I stand before you today, I don't know, you know, I've pastored a church for 17 years and the Lord's blessed it. Not, not because of me, I think largely in spite of me. And I think the real trick is staying out of the way. And if you can stay humble and stay hungry, there is nothing that God cannot do through you. But I think much of my reward has been forfeited because I did it for the wrong reasons. All I'm saying this afternoon is let's be shrewd as snakes, but let's make sure we're innocent as doves, that we're doing the right thing for the right reasons. The shorter Westminster Catechism, chief end of man, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's it. That's all I got. That's all I have. But at the end of the day, that's all that matters. I'm gonna close with a little story. It's gonna kind of bring closure to today and maybe set up what I wanna talk about tonight. A uh, hundred years ago, there was an evangelist by the name of Gypsy Smith. Uh, Gypsy Smith, uh, you gotta love the name. Born in a gypsy camp outside of uh, London in the Epping Forest and uh, never a day of formal education in his life, yet he lectured at Harvard. Grew up in a tent, invited by two presidents to the White House. Powerfully used of God, crisscrossed the Atlantic Ocean uh, 45 times, preached to millions of people, uh, never preached without someone surrendering their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. One day, a delegation of revival seekers sought him out and just simply said, how can we make a difference with our life the way that you have made a difference with, with your life, and here's what he said. He said, go home. He said, go home and lock yourself in your bedroom. He said, go home, lock yourself in your bedroom, take a piece of white chalk and draw a circle on your bedroom floor. He said, then kneel down in that circle and pray brokenly and fervently that God would send revival in that circle. How many times does scripture say, Joshua three is a great example Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now, there's not a person here that doesn't want God to do amazing things. Don't you want God to do amazing things? Like, man, I want God to do things that I can't take credit for, that my fingerprints are nowhere to be seen, but the fingerprint of God is so obvious. The problem is, is that we want to do God's job for him. And we're terrible at God's job. I'm terrible at amazing, but that's not my job. It's God's job to do amazing things. My job is to consecrate myself. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means to be set apart. It means to be fully surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that you dethrone yourself and you enthrone Christ. It means you tear down whatever idols are in your life. It means that your time, your talent, and your treasure belong to him. And, and if God could just get a hold of our hearts in that way, then I have every confidence that amazing things would happen. Oh, one, one last little thing. I'm on one minute of borrowed time, but it won't be longer than that. That video that showed you at the beginning, it was a Today Show. 
um, segment that aired nationally on Easter Sunday on national, on national Community Church. Can I tell you how that happened? This is so cool. It was day 40 of a 40-day prayer challenge where the Lord had put on my heart that we needed to circle 2 Chronicles seven fourteen for 40 days and see what would happen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. For 40 days at 7.14 a.m., kind of as a little trigger, we said, let's hit our knees. Let's humble ourselves before God and let's see what God does. I don't have time, I won't take the time to tell you everything that God did, but we had a million dollar church building gifted to us. Not anything we were seeking out, um, but it was on the last day that the Today Show came out, filmed that segment, and here's what I've learned. I don't wanna get in the news because I've found that the more publicity you get, the bigger the target on your back. But if God can be glorified, through it, then so be it. Because the good news ought to make the news. And the Lord Jesus Christ was glorified on that day. And it was simply because we said, God, we consecrate ourselves to you. Let's pray. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.